Hello there, good evening. Welcome to Look North, our top story tonight. What do we want? Send reform. When do we want it? Now. The parents protesting in Leeds for more funding and support for children with special educational needs. We speak to families who say they're in crisis. There's too many families, not just in Leeds, but up and down the country that are screaming for help. We all can't be wrong. Well, the government says they're increasing funding. Also tonight, the Duchess of Edinburgh pays a visit to staff and patients at Leeds Children's Hospital. A ban on adverts for junk food and gambling is coming to Sheffield City Council controlled billboards. And we meet 13-year-old from Ripon who's become one of the youngest qualified bell ringers in Yorkshire. Well, it's not been the most inspiring first days of spring. This was scar, but this morning looking pretty dreadful. But tomorrow should be a good deal brighter. Join me for the very latest. Hello, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. A service in crisis failing pupils with special needs. That's according to campaigners who've taken to the streets in Leeds today, calling for the council to carry out a radical overhaul of support services. In Yorkshire, almost 100,000 children receive SEN support in schools last year. That's an increase of 22% since 2016, when the number stood at just under 8,000 children receiving support. The Department for Education say they've invested £10.5 billion in the country's high-needs budget for this year. Nicola Rees has more. What do we want? Send reform! When do we want it? Now! In Leeds, they're angry about a system they say is failing autistic and disabled children. School support staff are struggling. They want a radical overhaul of special educational needs provision known as SEND. SEND REFORM! Quite often when you work with children um, that have behavioural difficulties, you can end up being assaulted, um, end up uh, experiencing violence. We need more staff, we need more money. Um, and we need support in the classes for the children that need the support. The situation now is nigh on dangerous. The amount of calls that I get as, as a union rep from my members and the stories they tell me of being assaulted, again, not those pupils' fault, um, it's heartbreaking to hear. Some children might have ADHD, so they need specialist support. Um, and if you're not qualified or trained in that, we have to do as best. But there's no money anywhere for us to be doing that. So some children are getting care from people that are not qualified. Clear your pink then. The lack of specialist provision has forced some parents to take their children out of school. 11-year-old Abigail has an autism diagnosis but can't get the help she needs. She suffers with social and emotional um, really badly. She, she sees the world completely different to everybody else. Abigail's been waiting for a place at a specialist school for nine months. It's really upsetting to families that are already going through hell and high water and then having to fight and make parents jump through hoops. There's too many families, not just in Leeds, that are screaming for help. We all can't be wrong. The council's responsible for funding the support for SEN children. It starts with a health and care plan known as an EHCP. In Leeds, they've issued three times more this year, resulting in a system under pressure. So we've put more resources in to try and speed up the EHCP process, uh, and, and we have done. Yeah, we've, you know, as I say, we've almost trebled uh, the, the number we did in 2023 compared to 22. But that's not enough. We need more SEND school places. I'll be talking in council later about new SEN places we're creating in Leeds. But we're having to fund them ourselves from Leeds. We're having to do it ourselves because the government are refusing to give the money to expand those places. The government say the SEND system's being reformed to deliver earlier intervention. They say 108 special free schools have been opened, including 15 since September. This, they say, is alongside increased high needs funding for young people with complex needs. But campaigners say the investment's not being felt on the ground and they'll keep fighting for safe staffing levels and fair pay. Nicola Rees, BBC Look North, Leeds.
Next tonight, a man who, who died after crashing a stolen car during a 13-second police chase was due motorway speeds, an inquest has heard. Daniel McBride died when the Mercedes he was driving collided with parked cars on Retford Road in Sheffield last April. He was being pursued by the police at the time, but the Independent Office for Police Conduct found there was no evidence that caused his death. Ollie Constable was in court. It was a scene of devastation, a crash involving three cars on Retford Road in Sheffield last April. A stolen Mercedes driven by Daniel McBride had collided with parked cars. Moments before, police had started pursuing Mr McBride, with a Mercedes reaching motorway speed seconds before the crash. Today, an inquest heard how, at about 11pm on the 10th of April, officers had followed the car for just 13 seconds, maintaining a large distance between them. We heard how the Mark police car had performed a U-turn to get behind the stolen vehicle and hadn't turned on its blue lights or sirens. A forensic police investigator told the court he thought the Mercedes was likely travelling at about 70 miles an hour when it crashed, far higher than the 40 mile an hour speed limit for the road. Mr McBride, we were told, wasn't wearing a seatbelt. His family said he was a lovable rogue and will be greatly missed by all, a father, brother, son and grandson. His mum said there will be a void in my life that will remain there forever. The assistant coroner recorded Mr McBride's death as one of multiple injuries from a road traffic collision. The independent police body said there was no evidence to suggest South Yorkshire police caused or contributed to his death. Ollie Constable, BBC Look North, Sheffield. You're watching Wednesday's Look North, still to come on tonight's programme. All that hard work being put in by the Halifax Town groundsman is going to be worth it because there's lots at stake here at the Shea tonight. Chesterfield need a point to be promoted back to the Football League. It's a big game for Halifax as well in their promotion push. But before that, a man accused of planning the robbery in which a police officer was murdered in Bradford 19 years ago has told a jury he was eating sandwiches in a car nearby and didn't know what was happening. 75-year-old Pirandita Khan denies the murder of PC Sharon Beshaniski, who was shot dead outside a travel agency in November 2005. At Leeds Crown Court today, Khan said he didn't know that two police officers had been shot until the robbers returned to a house in Leeds and people were panicking and shouting. A man's been taken to hospital after North Yorkshire Police negotiated a safe end to an incident in York. A safety cordon was placed around an address on Teal Drive in the Foxwood area at around 10am after a man threatened to harm himself and others. The road reopened just after 3 o'clock when the man was arrested and taken away for treatment. Police say they're very concerned about a woman in her 60s who's gone missing in Doncaster. 63-year-old Pam Johnson, who's also known as Shirley, was last seen on Thursday on Thorn Road. CCTV showed her wearing black clothes and carrying a white plastic bag. Well, yesterday Prince William was in Yorkshire and today we've had another royal visit. The Duchess of Edinburgh has spent some of the day at Leeds Children's Hospital. It's a hospital that she's patron of. She met patients and their parents on the wards and gave out Easter gifts for the children. Abigiola was there too. The Duchess of Edinburgh has been patron of the Leeds Children's Hospital since 2013. She's been a regular visitor over the years, but this is her first since before the pandemic. Hello. Hi. She was shown into the playroom on Ward L52, where she saw the new virtual reality headsets being used as a distraction technique when treating children. 13-year-old Brayden was demonstrating the kit. He's recovering from a spinal abscess. It helps me distracted from like getting my IV done or like getting my blood done because I'm not a big fan of needles. Then it was onto the ward to meet patients and their families. Some of the children have been here for months. You just helped me. I helped me like chocolates. <laughs> Today's visitor was warmly welcomed, as were the Easter gifts from the Leeds Hospitals charity. I was a little bit nervous at first, but when she come in, she's just like the rest of us, really. It's just so lovely to have visitors anyway. <laughs> it really, really helps us with our day-to-day -day, um, sort of process journey of getting through this.
I always been a, a big fan of the royal family, so I'm very pleased to meet one of the members. The Duchess also spent time talking to staff who work here. It's a ward that specialises in paediatric neurosciences. They treat more than 350 patients every year. It makes such a difference for our patients, their families, to be able to talk about their experiences with us, the challenges that they're going through. And from a staff perspective, it's a great boost in terms of uh, joy and happiness and their chance as well to showcase all the great work that they're doing every day. So much time was spent talking to the families that the Duchess's visit overran. She brought much needed smiles to the children. Some of them will be having treatments here for weeks to come. Abby Jayola, BBC Look North, Leeds. Oh, that looks lovely, doesn't it? They look very happy. Next tonight, if you live near an advertising billboard in Sheffield, change could be on the way. Hoardings controlled by the City Council will no longer promote fast food, gambling or even air travel as a way of influencing us all to live healthier lives and consider cutting our carbon footprint. Tom Ingle has more. Adverts are part of our lives and part of the landscape. In Sheffield, many billboards are run by private companies, but some are council controlled. If you drive around Sheffield in some of our most deprived areas, sometimes um, ads are targeted at the most vulnerable and areas of high deprivation. This is about changing that narrative. It will benefit our local residents. It's good for people and planet. Public health officials are describing the move as setting a tone. Sheffield won't be the first authority to try and nudge behaviour by removing adverts for fast food, gambling and vaping, but they will go further, dropping ads for petrol cars and even airlines. If we promote uh, healthy foods and healthy diet, that will be good that... Uh younger generation would be more encouraged to eat them. I think it definitely has the scope to influence a lot of people quite negatively, um, so I think it's quite a good thing. People talk about the nanny state, whereas I think it's the role of our elected representatives to keep us safe and to guide us towards acting in a way that's in our interests. In 2017, Liz and Charles Ritchie's son Jack took his own life after becoming addicted to gambling. They established the Gambling With Lives charity. We're all aware of just that we are surrounded by gambling advertising the whole time, on television, on social media, and then on billboards and, and public buildings. So it, it feels absolutely right that it's a public health crisis that we're facing, so it's public health measures like restricting and, advertising. And in the end, these are very, very addictive products that are being advertised. You know, they have addiction and at risk rates that are higher than heroin, and the public just do not know that. The ban will come into effect towards the end of the decade, when current management contracts for the council billboards elapse. Tom Ingle, BBC Look North, Sheffield. Next tonight, a Batley-born author whose debut novel has become the fastest-selling literary debut of the year so far. It's a work of fiction, but is based on Jenny Godfrey's memories of growing up in the shadows of the Yorkshire Ripper's crimes. Earlier, I caught up with her to discuss the impacts her book has had and what it was like growing up in Batley back in the 70s. So my childhood was very similar to the main character in the book, Miv's childhood. So I come from a very normal working class Yorkshire family. Everybody worked in the mills until they closed. I lived on a terrace street. Everyone knew everyone's business. So it's a fictional book, but it's very much based around a real person, Peter Sutcliffe, yes. a very dark character. Yes. Why did you want to involve that in the book? Well, I certainly, growing up in Yorkshire in the 1970s, he was like a phantom that haunted our childhoods. And in writing about that time in Yorkshire, it would be impossible not to write about him. And what do you remember about that, if you say he haunted your childhood? Well, I certainly re remember, and it's in the book, that instead of playing games like Kiss Chase, we played Ripper Chase. And he was this kind of threat or bogeyman to children, the Ripper will get you if you're not careful. Um, and I think lots of, in fact, a whole generation of Northerners, particularly women, will really remember that. Mm. And do you think that's what's connected with this book? Because there's been lots of books about the Yorkshire Ripper, but, you know, you're a Times top seller. 
<laughs> yeah, and I think it's because the book isn't about Peter Sutcliffe. The book is my love letter to Yorkshire and it celebrates community, it celebrates family, it celebrates difference. And I think that's what speaks to people more than the dark subject matter on which it's based. Mm, and there's a lot of nostalgia in there, isn't there? You know, the there things about the, you know, the, the, the heater that was a, a, a colour heater, you know, the, the parents' chairs in the lounge, lots of things that we could all relate to from the olden days, if you like. Yes, I mean, things like um, all the different sweets and foods that we used to eat. I mean, I went on a real trip down memory lane while I was writing it, and I also made sure to include all the Yorkshire phrases for these things. I know that you're now a southerner, but I you really am. are flying the flag for a Yorkshire writer here, and we don't often get on these lists, do we? We don't, and I definitely am a Yorkshire person at heart. You know, it's runs through me like a, a stick of rock. And I found as soon as I started writing about Yorkshire, I felt like I was back here um, celebrating life in Yorkshire in the 1970s. I know you're in a bit of a dream bubble still with all this at the moment, yes. Jenny, but enjoy the moment and we can't wait for your next book. Thank you very much indeed. It's a page turn on chapter two, can't put it down. Let's turn to football now and tonight could be the night at last for Chesterfield. The Spyrites are already runaway leaders of the National League and with seven matches left to play, all they need tonight is a draw from their match at Halifax to confirm promotion back to the Football League. Paul Ogden is there for us. It's a big night, Oggy. It is, uh, and it's one that's been a short time coming, actually, Amy. We were there, weren't we, at Wembley last summer when Chesterfield had to suffer the agony of that playoff final defeat against Notts County. Dramatic though it was, we wondered how they would recover and how Paul Cook and his wonderful Chesterfield team have recovered. 21 points clear at the top of the National League. They've got seven matches left to get one point that they need to be crowned champions and secure their return to the Football League at last. Starting here at the Shea tonight, they're going to have more than 2,000 fans here, up from North Derbyshire, uh, in the terrace behind me, to roar them on. And they are telling us that Chesterfield are a team worth watching. It's a good season for us, isn't it? We've had us ups, we've had us downs. Hopefully this season we're back in main part in uh, EFL. I'd recommend Chesterfield as a team to watch. Um, there are some teams that tend to stay behind the ball and park the bus, but uh, we're not one of those. So. Can you keep Paul Cook for the longer term at Chesterfield, do you think? I hope so. Obviously we've had him before. The last term we did excellent for us then. Got us out of League 2 into League 1. Hopefully he can do the same again. Hopefully we can push on straight into League 2 and then move on to League One again. That's the, that's the plan. Certainly sounds as if they're going to be a breath of fresh air eventually when they do get back in the Football League. They only need a point, Chesterfield. Kick-off tonight here for them at Halifax Town, 7.45. Uh, I wonder if you could pick up the worn pitch here at the Shea uh, and the stands that will house home fans. You'll have something to say, by the way, if they're screaming at the telly right now because Halifax Town themselves are in a promotion push this is a catch-up, delayed game for them. And if Halifax Town win, they will be in the playoff zone with about seven games to go themselves. Loads to look forward to, but I think either way, at Chesterfield on Saturday in their next game after tonight at home to Boreham Wood, there's going to be a party that goes on a long time in North Derbyshire. <laughs> I'm sure there is, Oggy, thank you. Now, here's a story with a difference. A boxing club in Scarborough has started a class for people with Parkinson's and it is having a remarkable effect. Westway Boxing Club in Eastfield has eight students with the condition so far and they've been training for six months now. Parkinson's is a progressive neurological condition affecting movement, muscle, strength and control. But these new boxers are certainly fighting back, as Carla Fowler reports. fighting to keep fit for as long as possible. Westway Club has been training boxers for three decades in Scarborough, but this is a new group of fighters facing a different kind of battle. Everyone here has Parkinson's. It's a heavyweight opponent, but they're slowing down its progress through boxing. So you start to learn your balance quite early on. You get the coordination and the strength builds up. Of course, once you can do that, you can punch harder. So 
Um, I think it affects all of those things and they're very important because what Parkinson's does is take away the ability of the mind to control the body, basically, and so you need to find new ways of doing it. We haven't recreated the wheel, we're just doing boxing training. I think it's, it's the rhythm, it's got everybody strong, everyone's improved. My granddad had had Parkinson's um, and through my training, through boxing, I'd seen other clubs and people doing similar things and I um, turned up to one of the people's coffee mornings and offered my services and we went from there. Parkinson's is a neurological condition with many different symptoms but a growing body of evidence suggests boxing specifically improves balance, coordination and agility, all things impacted by Parkinson's. The footsteps have got much better, the strength certainly in the left arm is uh, very much better. It keeps the body working, keeps the mind working. Even the consultant thinks uh, it's one of the best things that's happened for all of us. For many, it's a chance to release the daily frustrations their condition brings. It isn't how I foresaw my life panning out. You know, I've always been interested in sport, always kept myself fit, never done drugs or rarely drink. And, you know, it's kind of... You need to keep going. You know, I'm, I live on my own, so I need to be able to look after myself for as long as possible. I hope we can continue building on this and um, showing people the power of boxing used for Parkinson's is quite a special thing. At the moment, there is no cure for Parkinson's, but boxing could be the best therapy. Carla Fowler, BBC Look North, Scarborough. That's great, isn't it? And I'm sure after tonight they'll get some more recruits as well. Finally this evening, a teenager from Ripon has become one of the youngest qualified bell ringers in Yorkshire. The appeal for Alice, who lives across the road from the cathedral, was the sound of the bells and how it's created. So shown the ropes by a welcoming group of older ringers, the 13-year-old has now mastered the technique and is enjoying life as the youngest ringer in town. Heidi Tomlinson has been to meet her. Trouble's going, she's gone. Ringing practice at Ripon Cathedral. You might not expect to find a child holding the ropes. Two to three. But 13 year old Alice Barrett is a fully fledged member of the team. It's definitely more than just like pulling a rope, which is what most people think. It's much more complex, both physically and mentally. She's recently become one of the youngest qualified ringers in Yorkshire, having spent the last three years in training. I'm actually really proud of her. It's taken a long time for her to get from being a very small child to where she is now with the strength and the techniques. So just seeing her persevering and carrying on all that time and never giving up. Um, there's about 30 up to the bells. Climbing the steep ancient steps to the belfry is one of Alice's favourite things to do. It's sort of exciting to see what you're actually ringing. It is. And like the size um, of them is... Always very cool to see. Installed almost a hundred years ago, the 13 bells at Ripon each weigh two thirds of a ton, and of course they're dangerously loud close up. Before we hear this bell ring, we need to put our, our ear muffles on. Uh, these bells are, in, are incredibly loud up here, so um, it is kind of jet plane volume, 120 decibels up here when the bells are ringing. A majestic sound created by a skilled team. It takes strong arms to handle the bells and a certain height. Standing on a box helps. The younger somebody learns, then the quicker they pick up the skills, the less afraid they are of the rope and the bell and the bell swinging, and they just make progress so much quicker. Alice was nine when she first had a go. Now she's qualified at 13, on a par with veteran Joe Mitchell, who's in her 80s. It can be a lifelong hobby. It's a lovely sound and it's always different, like it sounds softer in here and then it sounds a lot louder outside. Heidi Tomlinson, BBC Look North, Ripon. Let's have some animals, shall we? Wildlife experts say otters in our rivers have been hit hard by recent floods, despite being really strong swimmers. Rescue centres say they've taken in record numbers of otter cubs. Oh, how cute. Have not been able to cope with floodwaters or have had their bankside homes destroyed in the storms. 
And talking of bad weather, cast your mind back to six years ago. This popped up six years ago today. Look at that, the sofa push. Can you believe that? You know, that was a really interesting month. We pushed that sofa over Stanage Edge with about a foot of snow. Can you remember? I remember it very well. Yeah, we've got a cover over the sofa because the weather was so bad, wasn't Ima it? I imagine Hudson's Kitchen in Crosspool will be very pleased. <laughs> yeah, they with, will. With that, that brings up such nice memories. Don't we miss Harry? We really we do, did, don't we? I can't we believe do. that was uh, six years ago. Anyway, that's Pately Bridge today. A little bit of uh, blossom, a bit of brightness in an otherwise uh, cloudy day. And uh, the second picture is, I think, from Scarborough. There we are. There's a few people around, but what a miserable day it is there. We've even got some fog uh, covering the castle in Scarborough. I can promise you something much brighter for tomorrow. If you've got any pictures, send them to me uh, on Twitter, on Instagram, or on the Weather Watcher website. So, a uh, brighter picture tomorrow. Not entirely dry. There is a very weak weather front that might bring a little patchy rain for a time, but uh, there'll be some sunny intervals as well. A lot of clouds streaming in from the west. There's the Atlantic weather chart. This cold front's really important behind it. This colder air, as its name suggests, so there's a number of ice about. So the weekend looks quite cold and windy. Sunshine and showers, those showers could be wintry over the very tops of the Pennines. Now, there's a radar picture. This weather front that's brought the rain and drizzle just clearing now. It's covering Lincolnshire. It's just clearing eastern parts of South Yorkshire. So we can look forward to an improvement as we head through this evening. And overnight, with light winds, we could see some mist and fog for a time. Otherwise, it's a mostly fine night, cooler than of late. We're looking at lowest temperatures around 4 or 5 degrees. So tomorrow's high water times in Scarborough at one fifty nine, Bridlington at 2.32. So a generally bright start. It will be fairly cloudy at times. And there's that weak warm front just bringing a, a little patch of rain just for a short period of time, really not amounting to very much. And I think behind that we'll see some bright or sunny spells. Temperatures still above average for this time of the year. Peaking again, eastern parts of South Yorkshire favoured at 14 Celsius. That's 57 Fahrenheit. Friday looks dry with some sunshine, but feeling colder. Over the weekend, it is unsettled and windy, sunshine and showers, although uh, those showers fewer and furthest between on Sunday. These temperatures actually are average for the middle of March, unsettled next week. That is the forecast. 19 Amy. degrees in London today. Never mind, we're not in London, 19 we're in Yorkshire. 19 degrees, we and today we've London. been wearing coats. This is the start, isn't it, where we do the comparisons of the north-south divide. <laughs> uh, that's it from us. Um, we will be back at half ten this evening. But have a lovely evening for now. Bye-bye.